And our AFMO at the time said, well, Monica, what, what made you decide to be a leader of people? And it kind of took me back a little bit because I didn't decide that. This is the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center podcast. I'm Alex Victoria, Assistant Center Director of the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center here in sunny Tucson, Arizona. On today's podcast, Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center analyst Travis Dotson chats with Monica Morrison, a fire operations specialist from the beautiful Payette National Forest. The topic... Hey, it's 2020. Take a guess. For today's podcast, we wanted to bring you the very latest on all things COVID-19. Some of this is hot off the press and might or might not be relevant or applicable or even correct by the time you finish listening to this. Sounds like we're chasing our tails here, huh? Actually, for this podcast, we want to bring you a conversation about leadership. Some concepts and tools that are always relevant, but might be even more important as 2020, the year that's given us so much already, continues to unfold. Some of you might think this is a distraction. This is where I say you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. One thing we think we've discovered here at the Lessons Learned Center in the first few months of the pandemic, folks seem super hungry for, quote, normal fire stuff. And while 2020 is anything but normal, we do want to give you some time away from what seems like continual change and turmoil associated with the pandemic. With that in mind, we bring you today's conversation, the topic, Command Presence. What do you think of when you hear the term command presence? What's the image that comes to mind? Who is it that you visualize when you think of the term command presence? Well, if you're like me, for all tough questions, you go to the internet, right? Ha ha! Does my truck need a new motor? Do I have coronavirus? How my bike's making that horrible sound? What's the best pancake recipe in the known universe? No, no, seriously, do, do I have coronavirus? Let's do another search. Command presence. Why do I think there should be two S's in presence? It's, yeah, anyhow. To see what command presence looks like to the internet, I click here where it says images, and voila, there it is, command presence. What do I see? Well, it might be some of the same sorts of images most of you thought of when I asked you about the term a second ago. I see a lot of dudes in uniform, lots of soldiers and law enforcement officers. I see a bunch of awesome mustaches. Here's a dude talking on the radio, of course, and then another dude doing push-ups. Huh, that's weird. So, is that what command presence is? Not even close. What it is, is a tough thing to describe. And fortunately, for 2020, we've got a bunch of great resources to help us with this question and understand more about what command presence is. As part of the Wildland Fire Leadership Development Program's annual National Leadership Campaign, 2020 is focused on command presence. I'll give you the scoop on where to find those resources in a bit. Before we get there, let's go to the discussion between Travis and Monica Morrison. Monica will introduce herself in just one second. As you listen in, maybe your image of command presence, what it looks like, what it sounds like, and who has it, will begin to change. When it's like a fire class or whatever, and, you, and they say, okay, everybody go around and introduce yourselves. Like, what, what's your uh, standard fire intro? Well, my name <laughs> is Monica Morrison, and I am currently a FOS on the New Meadows District on the Payette National Forest. 
So that's kind of uh, basically like a field operations kind of job, sort of pick up the odds and ends uh, for the AFMO and the FMO. I do some duty officer in. I am a division on a team, so I try to support that national effort and then uh, try to get out into the field and help out folks on fires out there if they need it or do burn Boston for the fuel fuels group, stuff like that. Almost like a utility player, right? You just kind of fit in where, where you need to fill the space. Yep, that is very true. It's kind of <laughs> like, yeah, a little bit of a Swiss Army knife. They kind of uh, <laughs> have, have you do whatever needs to get done, I guess. Cool, yeah, but tell us, like, where you start, how, how you how you got to being a FOZ. Um, I started down on the Dixie National Forest um, in college. I was actually doing working for Range, and it's like, oh, whoever wants to go to fire school uh, can go. So I went, helped out on the engines and the hand crews there for a couple of seasons in the summer. And then graduated college and made the famous claim that I just wanted to do one full fire season. <laughs> uh, got a, yeah, got a job on the UN Wasatch Cache in Pleasant Grove on the squad there. Worked my way up there a little bit. I uh, was there as the squad boss on that little IA mod for a few years and then uh, got a job running the uh, Hell's Canyon Wild Vampire Module in Council, Idaho, uh, which was just called Crew One when I got there. It was a 10-person IA crew, and then uh, we gradually worked our way from uh, a Type 2 module to a Type 1 module, and then got the job here uh, as the FOSS. Sweet. So that classic claim of, like, oh, I just want to do one year, right? Like, <laughs> what kept you around? Uh, honestly, I really liked being a ski bum, so it was a really nice schedule to be able to work in the summers and then spent, you know, close to a decade up at Snowbird, just, you know, getting my 100 days a season and uh, waiting to go back to work in the spring, so it kind of facilitated the lifestyle I wanted, and then uh, just <laughs> Really enjoyed the camaraderie and then uh, a job that they pay you to work out and they pay you to be outside. You know, at first I kind of couldn't believe it was a job. It just is a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. You know, what I heard in that description, though, is like you, you become a, a, a squad leader and then you get your own crew and then you work in a module. It's like I hear a bunch of leadership in there. What What was that like for you kind of? stepping into leadership because for some people it's like this super it's this barrier for them and other people step into it i don't know what's your experience with with uh leadership roles um i really enjoy it for sure i uh i guess part of my original bio i usually tell people um i was raised in a family with uh four brothers we have um a little sister now who just turned 16 but growing up i just had the four boys uh, the four brothers, and they're all like large stature humans. They're just kind of big dudes, and they're loud and they're opinionated. So that's for me, like that feels like home. You know, that's really an environment that I feel mm-hmm. really comfortable in. So kind of being around a bunch of dudes all the time that were sort of type A and whatever, that didn't, that felt pretty natural for me. And I do remember uh, my first year running the squad in Utah, and our AFMO at the time said, well, Monica, what what made you decide to be a leader of people? And it was kind of, kind of took me back a little bit because I didn't decide that, right? I never thought about it, and I wasn't even necessarily, like, striving to work towards the next thing. And so my answer at that time was what really was just kind of, you know, watching some folks uh, do it what I thought was wrong or a way that I I didn't agree mm-hmm. with thinking that it'd be really nice to give it a shot and see uh kind of see what I got and see if I see if I'd have better results or not. <laughs> <laughs> so basically you watch somebody else like screw it up and you're just like, "Oh man, watch the here. Let me let me let me show you how yeah. it's done." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think like we all kind of have that idea, you know, at some point like, "Oh, I could do this better." Then you get into that position and you're like, oh, holy crap, this is harder than it looks. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Well, cool. Uh, That, you know, that uh, that makes sense that, you know, that like you weren't looking for it or, um, you know, to to be caught off guard by the the question of 
what made you decide to become a leader of people when you're just like, wow, I, I, I didn't really decide that, did I? <laughs> you know, but here I am. Yeah. Wait a minute, I'm leading people? So that's a genuine path for sure. But obviously, part of the intent here today is to talk about command presence, you know, that term, that idea, um, all coming from the, the uh, leadership curriculum, uh, which you and I have both been uh, involved in. But, yeah, like, uh, from your perspective, why are we talking about command presence today? I think that it's, it's kind of just an interesting topic. I think there's been, um, in my mind, a little bit of a of a cultural shift. You know, newer firefighters coming in and even the firefighters that are still around, it's sort of a new generation, and uh, folks might be starting to connect with a, a different sort of style of command presence. Yeah, I remember also, like, when I got that first job running a squad, I definitely remember people, you know, kind of telling me, like, well, you're not <laughs> you're not really, like, big enough or strong enough or, like, I obviously have this little tiny voice and, like, your voice isn't going to be loud enough to be able to have command presence. And I don't think that that idea is around as much anymore, and maybe I'm living in a bubble here on the payette, but... Uh, I don't, you know, I, I feel like people are a little more open-minded to uh, different kinds of leadership, and you don't necessarily have to, you know, come into a room and be a giant person with this booming, you know, wonderful voice to, to have command presence. And, you know, for me, sometimes that person comes in and it's a, it's a detraction for me, right? Like, that's not necessarily the type of person I want to follow anyways. Yeah. Yeah, that's so true, because I feel like for a long time when, when people heard that term, command present, what it brings up for them is actually kind of a caricature of, yeah, right, the the old school person in charge. Yeah. There's a, there's all kinds of cool stuff, obviously, in the leading in the wildland fire service, um, which has, you know, a, a whole page of, and, it, and, and when you read what it actually says, it's all the things like character and stuff like that. But the example that's in there is is Edward Pulaski, you know, at the cave, right. you know, pointing the gun, and when they say, oh, come outside, the boss is dead, and he, like, raises from the dead and says, like, hell he <laughs> is, you know, I mean, it's like, like yeah, that's the totally. example of command, which is a, a, a form or a version, you know, of, of command present, but there's so much more to it, uh, like, I think, like, what you're getting, what you're getting into describing it. So, yeah, to, to you, what is, what is command presence? I mean, I think, you know, to define command presence, I think it, it's almost like you're a little bit of your first impression. So there's your first impression if you're going to be leading, you know, what do people think of you initially? And then I, it's kind of hard for me to define, but I, yeah, I think it's sort of the, the air that you carry yourself with. You know, people are trying to decide uh, on a whim or in short order, if they can trust you, if they can trust your decisions, and, you know, kind of if you have what it takes to get the team where they need to be. So I think it's uh, sort of trying to portray all of those things through words, through actions, through body language, sort of trying to paint this picture for folks that they can follow you, that you're going to uh, take them the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that picture you painted of the person walking in the room and having the big booming voice and kind of, you know, I don't know, for some reason, I, I when I start even just saying that, I, I end up putting my hands on my on my hips, right? Like like a power pose or something. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I guess the other side of that is not, you know, you inhibiting command presence, but what kind of command presence experiences have you had in fire and what are you, which, what types of presence makes you want to follow somebody and which ones um, kind of make you not trust somebody? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think for me, like some of the the characteristics that, that I, you know, that, makes me want to follow someone in, you know, quick order or whatever. Like some of the things that are important to me is really just someone that's willing to make a decision. So not that they don't take input or that they're not listening to others or that they're, you know, making a decision in an instant, but they're they're willing to make decisions that they think are, are right for people. Um, and I also think, you know, competence. So just being, uh, you know, confident in the decisions that the decisions that they're that they're making that goes along that goes a long way for me. I think that there is, 
you know, some people do sort of have this innate characteristic that is that makes people want to follow them, and whether it's charisma or whatever it is, you know, I, I feel like there are certain people that just sort of have that. Not to say that all of us can't can't develop skills, you know, but I definitely think that some people do, you know, sort of just have have that charisma. Yeah, you know, and I I go back and forth on this same thing when I when I ask myself that same question of, you know, what makes me want to follow some someone and yeah. oftentimes an element of it is genuine. Are they being genuine? You know, because I actually appreciate it if somebody is in a tough spot and they go, oh, man, this is this is kind of this is difficult. I've never faced anything like this. But, and they're somehow able to voice that and yet still embody confidence like, oh, but we're totally. going to figure it out. And we're, yeah, we're going to like just because I, I've never faced this before and I have some some unknowns doesn't mean we're not going to get it done. The thing that makes me not want to follow people is the opposite of that is when they're trying to pretend like they have every answer and they're just going to fake it even if they even if they you know what I mean in an effort yeah. to come across as competent or whatever. <laughs> yeah, totally. And then I don't know, I mean I don't know if that that uh, authenticity you know, uh, obviously has to sometimes include vulnerability and all that kind of stuff. And those are the, uh, I feel like those are the things that are starting to get into what you're talking about. Hey, it's a, I don't know if it's a generational thing or just a, a growth and diversity type thing where we're, we're more open to that kind of stuff versus the large and in charge all the time commanding, you know, thou shalt type leadership. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally. And I think like that kind of just drives home for me quite a bit because I, you know, I'm, I'm a smaller person, uh, and then I have this, this tiny voice that can be hard to hear, you know? So originally, you know, coming up, I thought, yeah, like that, that's a challenge for me, but everybody has challenges. We all are going to be dealing with different challenges as we're developing our leadership styles. Kind of going back to my giant brothers, my family of brothers, it's like if I if we're having a, a heated discussion, some people would call it an argument, my brothers call it a discussion, I literally raise my hand in family discussions in order to get the floor because <laughs> I, just, I just don't have the voice to talk over anybody. And it's kind of the same thing, like, after morning, you know, morning briefing on a team assignment and it's time for division breakouts, right? Like, I usually have to recruit some tall dude with a loud voice to to yell division alphas over here because I, you know, I'll try, but no one's going to hear. And so I think that, you know, there's some of those things that we can perceive as big barriers, but there, there's always ways to get around that. And that's not, you know, those barriers don't define who you are as a leader it's kind of how you work around those or or with those um that kind of you know define you define who you are and help to develop your leadership style absolutely and it turns out like that's leading by example right like all of a sudden you have made yourself accessible to all these other people right when they see you doing that yeah um, that's the thing i like is when somebody goes you know, you, you have no idea how many people you've inspired by just going like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't have the big booming voice and all that. And that's actually not that big a deal. Watch this. I'll get this, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this other person to do it for me. It's actually not that big a deal. <laughs> and I, I think that that's, uh, that's super cool. And I like on that front, what, you know, do you have instances of people critiquing your command presence and kind of um, using either the old or the new paradigm and in, in, in giving you feedback about, you know, your style? Yeah, I do. I do for sure. Um, I also think, like, we're all just really different, and so each of us is going to connect with a different style of command presence, too. So I think yeah. going back to what you said with being genuine and authentic, like, that's really all you have right, is to be yourself, because some people just aren't going to like your style, right, and other people are going to really connect with your style, so it's just all you can do is be who you are, and that's going to work for some folks, and it's not going to work for other folks, and that's all right. Um, but as far as your examples, I, I think it was my first assignment as a qualified division, and, you know, kind of asked the group for feedback, and that was, you know, some of the feedback I got uh was basically like well 
you, you kind of, it's, it's too bad you're not bigger and, you know, a little bit louder. I think you're going to really struggle with your command presence and dealing, you know, with hot shot suits and dealing with, uh, you know, whatever more, uh, overbearing resources. And so I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's not, that's not super useful because I can't change that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. thanks, for, thanks for the feedback. I'll consider it. And then on the the next fire I was on, actually had um, you know a hot shot suit uh, compliment me on my command presence and say like, hey, I really you know I really like your style and wasn't sure what to think about you at first, but I've been impressed by your command presence, you know. So thanks for being decisive and uh, you know taking care of us out here on the line. It's appreciated. So kind of yeah. kind of fun to have those two. That the feedback sort of right in a row. So you go on your first one and they're just like, yeah, it's cool, but you know, hotshot soup's gonna eat you alive. And then you go at yeah. your next roll and the hotshot soup's like, man, I really like yeah, that. Exactly. Like that's, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. Uh, I remember yeah. as a division trainee, that was always my, my fear. I was just like, oh my God, what's, what's gonna happen when I come in, you know, come up against again, a caricature, right? The hotshot soup that, that <laughs> lives to just crush division soups, you know? And I never ran into it. Um, I ran into other people that wanted confrontation, but when you when you come back to it, if you're if you're genuine, a, a lot a lot of people that see a lot of other people in leadership roles, man, they really appreciate when you're when you're just who you are, like you said. Yeah, um, exactly. And uh, and I, I the reason I asked that is I was just having a conversation with somebody who was telling me a story about like. Somebody, you know, giving command presence feedback and, and the telling a, a, a person that was given a briefing, like, you shouldn't wear your hair like that because it makes you look stuck up and it affects your command presence. Yeah. And she's like, really? Like, that's the feedback you have is about, like, my hair? My hair do? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> it's, just, I mean, it's one of those instances where it just reveals more about the person giving the feedback, right? <laughs> Yeah, totally, totally. It's like, okay, I guess you don't like that haircut, but how did I do operationally? <laughs> yeah, did you listen to anything I said? Yeah. It's funny, and, I, you know, so I guess the thing that I, I, I run into a lot, which is kind of like, oh, kids these days, whether it's, you know, millennials or they're always on their phones or... You know, there's not enough farm kids anymore. There's kind of that that attitude of like, oh, the, gen- the, the latest generation doesn't want to work hard, that kind of stuff. And then there's also this other, you know, perspective of, like, man, these operators know so much more than I did when I was at that level. And it just gives me so yeah. much hope, you know, and I yeah. and I hear both sides of that everywhere I go, you know, in terms of developing leaders because you're you're in that level now right where you're you're bringing up other leaders um in addition to being yeah. yourself so yeah. do you have a, a a thought on that yeah one of the things that i've been thinking about a lot lately and i think it's from you know some of the work that we're doing with the leadership committee like we're the first generation i'm the first generation that was brought up with the leadership curriculum i've never not had it Right, like I had L L one eighty from the beginning. I think the maybe the second or third year it came out. Uh so it's interesting for me to think about the shift in culture. So uh the leadership stuff was created uh, you know, as a mitigation from a fatality fire and that uh that's great that that's why it came about. And uh, a lot of the folks that were developing that were uh, sort of pushing back against the elbows and assholes culture, the, you know, nobody cares what you think, just dig culture. And uh, it's like, here we are, right? It worked. <laughs> like we're, we've now brought up this generation of thinkers and people who are outspoken and people who uh speak up when they see something and people who think of different ways of doing things and are vocal about it and that's what we were trying to get people to do so it's kind of interesting for me when uh you know the newer generation as they're coming in they're exhibiting a lot of that and uh, some of the older generation will will sort of look down on that and oh, they don't like to work hard or they want to question everything I do and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, that's what we were going for. 
Emperor. Congratulations, you won. Totally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of interesting, you know, to think about it that way. And then even just the generational stuff's pretty interesting because the, you know, the newer generation, uh, including myself, you know, the, the values that we were taught from our parents, and you can see it in, uh, you know, the, the 18 and 20 and 25 year olds that are coming up. It's like we're, we're taught to value experiences. Uh, we were taught not to work our lives away. We were taught to live life, you know, do what we want while we have the time. Like do the fun things before you die. Don't wait until you retire because you might not make it. You know, we're all coming up into our own and coming into that and, you know, so some of the challenges are people move around a lot, right? Like they go to a ranger district or a home unit for a few years and then they're ready to move on. Uh, or they, you know, want to take vacations in the summertime or they, you know, want to take the winters off or whatever it is. You know, that's generational. That, that was taught from our parents, taught us to live life while we have it. And we're we're seeing that coming up in the organization, and it conflicts with some of our you know older values, I think. For sure, and which I, you know, it's another version of like if you go to any staff ride, and at the end, there's always several people whose you know big takeaway in the integration is, man, you know, life, you never know. And so my yeah. my takeaway is I'm gonna. I'm going to spend more time with my family and I'm going to, you know, do the things that are really interested because, you know what I mean? Like that's always yeah. somebody's takeaway at a staff, right? And then, and then there, here's, here's people out there like you doing it. And then we're just like, well, well, you are, there's no loyalty or whatever, you know, they change jobs too often. Or, yeah. Or they, or yeah, they're all about vacation and, uh, you know, that kind of, it's the same thing that I feel like I experience when, when people are like, oh, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't seen you out on, you know, team assignments or have you know, and then I'm like, well, I'm trying to like implement the lessons because what every, what every old firefighter says is, you know, I, I feel like I missed too many little league games and, and, and birthdays. And, yeah. you know, I wish I would have, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I stayed home with my daughter because I'm trying to implement the lessons of not missing that for a fire assignment. Yeah. It's like the old thing of like nobody nobody gets to their deathbed and says, "Oh, I, I sure wish I would have worked a few more days." <laughs> you know? But you know, on the other side of that, it doesn't preclude just be, by having that attitude doesn't preclude you from totally embodying the leadership curriculum that you were you know that that your generation is so fortunate to have come up with you know, and I think that's a super insightful thing to to point out. Well, cool. There's so much good stuff there, but is there anything else you want to throw in there about uh, command presence? I think my my parting words really would just be uh, just exactly what I said before. Just be who you are. Uh, be confident in who you are and just kind of own it. You know, you are who you are and you're always going to be changing and you're always going to be developing. Don't fight who you are. Uh, and that'll go a long way with people. People want to follow someone who they know is genuine. Uh, and if, like you mentioned, Travis, if you don't know something, people are going to see right through that if you try and fake it. If you can be upfront about it, you know, people are going to have your back and try and support you for the most part. I mean, you're always going to have kind of the haters that are trying to be, bring people down, but I like to think that they're fewer in number. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of my parting words is just, you know, don't don't get – too caught up on on trying to be this image of whatever someone told you command presence was and instead focus on uh, building your competency and building your skills and uh, using that to allow yourself to feel confident and uh, that'll that'll sort of build your command presence for you sweet that's a that's a great tie up there Oh man, I'm excited. Monica, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to, to chat with us. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks so much, Travis. Thanks so much to Travis and Monica for that great chat. To get to some more resources associated with command presence in Wildland Fire, yep, you got it. It's back to the internet for another quick search. The easiest way to find the Wildland Fire Leadership Development Program resources on Command Presence is to search 
Command Presence Wildland Fire. Those four words. In your top few results, you should see the 2020 National Leadership Campaign, where you will see a ton, and I mean actually 2,000 things, or darn near it, it seems like, that focus on the concept of command presence. There's a bunch of thoughtful exercises and challenges on this page. Be sure to check them out. To come all the way back around to 2020 and COVID-19, be sure to visit wildfirelessons.net. From there, you'll be able to find all the reports and lessons we've received in 2020 that deal with COVID-19 and wildland fire operations. Also, from wildfirelessons.net, if you're registered there, you can join and participate in several connected communities that are working to share COVID-19 resources and lessons. One of these communities is simply called COVID-19 and Fire Season 2020. Again, to access this community, you'll need an account at wildfirelessons.net, which is a simple process that takes just a minute to set up. Music this week, once again, from Blue Dot Sessions. Find them on the worldwide information superhighway internets at sessions.blue. Finally, and particularly in the time warp that's been the last several months of the coronavirus pandemic, thanks a ton for your time. Recently, on one of our Lessons Learned Center Teams calls, Travis wanted some feedback on some analysis he'd been working on. The analysis was great. So good, in fact, that I felt the need to bring Travis back down to earth. The best way I know how? Make fun of his haircut. Needless to say, Travis was confused. Not offended. Just really confused. That's the feedback you have is about, like, my hair? 